everyone to this installment of the 2020 lecture series at the Frontier Culture Museum of Virginia. My name is Doretta Sobolewski and I'm the research coordinator here at the museum and today I am delighted to have Bethany Worley with me who will speak about Moonshine Blue Ridge style, the history of culture, history and culture of untaxed liquor in the mountains of Virginia. Before we get started, I would like to thank Virginia Humanities for supporting this lecture series. They are a great organization and support a lot of wonderful projects all across the state. If you would like to support programs like our lecture series here at the museum, please consider giving to the American Frontier Culture Foundation. If you're watching this video on our website, the donate button is located in the lower left corner of the site. Um, if you're watching it from uh, on our YouTube channel, the link is included in the comment section below. So thank you so much. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Bethany. Bethany is director of the Blue Ridge Institute and Museum at Ferrum College in Franklin County. She has a bachelor's degree in geography and Appalachian studies from Emory and Henry College and a master's degree in cultural geography from the University of Memphis. Previous to her graduate schooling, Bethany worked at the BRIM curating the museum's first exhibit, Folk Instruments and Their Makers. Bethany curated, designed, and installed the Governor Rick, Ned Ray McWhorter Museum in the Weekly County Library in Dresden, Tennessee, and was the former governor's personal consultant. Bethany was also the director of the University of Tennessee at Martin's Jackson campus. Since returning to the BRIM, Bethany has focused on exhibits, homeschooling, programming, community events, and the endowment. So Bethany, thank you so much for joining us here. And um, we're really excited to hear about your talk. So tell us a little about it. Okay, well, I'm just pleased to join you all and talk about, um, I guess, um, just distilling in the Blue Ridge of Virginia and especially um, what I know of in Franklin County. But I'll begin with a slideshow and just a little bit about you know, who we are at the Blue Ridge Institute and Museum. And we started in um, 1973. It's been almost half a century. It's amazing that we have been, been around. And Fram College has only been around since 1916. So here we're gonna start with our, that's our nice little logo there, our apple basket. And we'll go into the next slide. And there's the museum. I don't know if some of you all have ever visited, but that is the um, outside of the museum right there. And the next slide will show you right there is our farm museum. It's 1800s farm museum. And we are really proud of that because it's taken many years, um, really since 1973 to create what you see right there. And we've been adding on, moving buildings. Um, one of our buildings that we got termite uh, problems and we had to, to do away with that and build another one. But um, it's, it's entirely authentic and accurate. So we're really proud of that. And the next slide will show you, I believe, that's our newest building. Um, it's the Leo Scott Educational Pavilion. We always wanted an area um, over at the farm because we give about 45 school tours a year. And we wanted um, something so the kids could hang out and have lunch, have restrooms, and also be used um, for other events. So you can see here the kids just love getting dressed up in their cute little costumes. And um, it's just a wonderful um, way for us to work with our community. And the next slide here, uh, a little bit about us. We are part of the Crooked Road, which is covers uh, over 300 miles through 10 counties in Virginia. And we are um, on the Eastern edge of it. And the Blue Ridge Institute and Museum is a major venue. Um, on this um, because of our archives related to music and because of the Blue Ridge Folklife Festival. Next slide. And that's probably why you may have heard of us is our Blue Ridge Folklife Festival, which we did not get to have this year, but we were ready with all of our um, print materials to do this. Um, we have about 12,000 people that come every fourth Saturday of October and um, they see all kinds of Blue Ridge folkways that have not gone away. They have um, been retained by their families or friends or neighbors, and they are showcased um, just on one day. And let's go through a couple of those, the next slide. 
We have great string music like Wayne Henderson right there in the next slide. Gospel music. We have tremendous gospel music. Um, and we have last year um, one stage devoted entirely to African American gospel music. So it's been one of our most popular stages. We have three stages of music in all. And this has been just a phenomenal success and just a lot of fun to connect with, with um, these churches in the whole Blue Ridge region. The next slide here will show us um, handicrafts, quilting. And um, that's one thing people really think a lot about when they want to come to the Folk Life Festival, um, what kind of quilts will I see? And so we have folks like this young woman quilting for us and showing people how she does her stitching and all that. Next slide. And of course we have the horses. These draft horses are just amazing creatures. And this is a draft horse pool right here where they pull different amounts and they win prize money. They win uh, really pretty trophies. And what's so neat about the Folk Life Festival, um, if you've ever been, you've probably noticed, but we really have all kinds of different um, groups of people. We have the horse people, we have the coon hound people, we have people that um, are musicians. So it's just a great day to experience all kinds of culture. And the next slide here, we have wheat threshing. And I remember growing up hearing about wheat threshing. And so this is, we're showing that, hey, this still goes on. This is what wheat threshing is. And this is um, really popular in our farm area because we want to showcase the agricultural traditions that are still alive within our own community. And the next slide, coon hounds. Now this is one of the most popular things that we've ever done at the Folk Life Festival is have um, our coon hound um, water race. And folks line up across Adams Lake right here like it was, they're gonna see a huge concert or something. And it is fascinating because people do um, hunt with coon hounds and we have the Back Creek Coon Club of Franklin County, which sponsors this. And it is just um, hours of water races and um, watching the coon hounds try to uh, go up a tree. So it's, um, it's really remarkable to see um, how these dogs are trained by their owners. And this is, again, one of our most popular events of the Folk Life Festival. I can definitely see that. That looks really interesting. <laughs> Except that little yes. guy in the box, he really doesn't want to get his feet wet. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Oh, and I wanted to show, so that's what we have at the festival. But, you know, we do other things as well. Um, but oh, most I'm people sorry. know it's from the festival. But yeah. we have over nine albums that we have produced that is now part of Smithsonian Folkways. And this is one of the albums that we have right here. And so uh, we, you know, we never got rid of the vinyl at the Blue Ridge Institute and we even have cassettes and, and CDs. Mm -hmm. And those can be bought through our online gift shop or actually through Smithsonian Folkways as well. Yeah, the Smithsonian has some amazing recordings on there. They do. Yeah. We also do lots of exhibits. We normally have two exhibits at one time in our galleries. And this was one that was really popular, it was called Full Throttle. It was about hot rodding in Virginia. And most people don't know much about that, but it's a big subculture um, in, in the Blue Ridge region is hot rodding and how it came about and how it still is very popular and with all kinds of different groups. So that was one of our most popular exhibits. All right, the next slide. So now we're gonna talk about, um, and I just love that logo, for, Virginia is for moonshine lovers, mm -hmm. but we're gonna talk about um, distilling in the Blue Ridge and uh, kind of focus on Franklin County because that's what, what um, I know most about. But folks started doing this, and if you wanna show the next slide, right there. Oh, this is how popular it is in Franklin County. We have a moonshine heritage car show because people just, you know, they think of moonshine and think of Franklin County, Virginia, which is not bad. We actually have the largest moonshine memorabilia collection in the country. And we are always getting all kinds of requests from folks all over the country and even internationally for um, information, for copies of photos, um, to loan them different artifacts like moonshine stills. So we have, we, we run the gamut and we always have this annual car show and we have about a hundred cars every May 
or April, it depends on how it falls. And unfortunately we couldn't have it this year, but we hope to have it um, upcoming next April. And it just showcases the cars that have been used in um, the production of moonshine or hauling it and the ones that would have been used. So let's go into the next slide. And here we were featured, and I don't think many people got to see this, unfortunately, um, this really nice um, um, article about us in the Shenandoah Valley and beyond publication. And they wanted to um, feature us all about Franklin County and our moonshine heritage and why it is so popular. And um, as I was saying, it's just um, in the Blue Ridge, the way it was settled in all of the Blue Ridge, you had a lot of the Scots Irish, you had, you know, what we have in our 1800s farm is, it would have been settled by Germans in, in this, what, what we have set up with our farm museum. And everyone pretty much had their own little still because they wanted to produce their own alcohol. And whether it was for their consumption or even for, you know, say medicinal purposes, they had it. So it was not, you know, anything outrageous. It was just part of, um, the landscape at the farm. Okay, next photo. And there you have, you see some of, I don't know if we can kind of zoom in maybe a little bit on that, I'm not sure, but we have um, a collection of historical photographs showing what these stills look like. And again, um, Franklin County, people wonder, well, all other, you know, counties in the Blue Ridge had these, you know, stills or operations. What made it so popular and flourished so much in Franklin County. And one of those reasons was because of um, the topography of the area. Franklin County, it's really interesting, it goes from the Piedmont, which is kind of flat rolling, to the foothills of the Blue Ridge. And uh, that's the western part of the, the county, and that's where we are located, and where actually I'm from, my whole family. And it's more mountainous, and it has a lot of um, mountain laurel, rhododendron, it's got a lot of creeks, so you had the fresh water. And so it just was perfect, it was a perfect place to locate um, your alcohol still and um, hopefully not be discovered. And, you know, these folks, it was hard living. Um, when you settled in the area, again, you had your own, probably your own still, but it was also a great way to supplement your um, existence when you're trying to farm and make the best that you can out of what you've got in the area. Um, if you had, say, um, apples and you had extra apples, well, maybe you couldn't get those to the farm, you know, farm market or wherever, the store to sell. Well, hey, you could turn around and make those into some nice brandy. And that's what folks would do and they were used to doing it and they did not want to be taxed for it. And so they started just making it, um, you know, for themselves and for other folks as well. All right, the next slide here. And there you see, I think this is really interesting. If you look at this, you have a little calf in the front and the calf is eating some leftover mash that um, was a byproduct of making the moonshine here. And this was in Franklin County this historical photo, and this was about, we think about, I don't know, around 1913 or so. And it shows you kind of like the lean-to that they would build so they could house their steel up under there and um, the men at work there. And it was, it was very hard work. It was, you were out um, kind of in the middle of nowhere and you had to stay there. You couldn't just set something up and leave. You had to stay there for weeks to get your um, product made and to get it bottled. And then you had to somehow get it to where you wanted it to get it. So these folks, you know, I, I just think it's um, also a very uh, prideful thing in that people like to think about their ancestors as being tough. And folks were very tough to be able to um, make a living doing this type of thing because it was not easy. And so people do like to you know, they just see it a part of, as part of their heritage that, you know, it took special people to, to make this product and to actually make a living then from, from only this. And the next photo, 
we have, I don't know if you can tell, that's a gentleman on the left there. And he is, to the right of him, is a huge still. It's called a turnip style still. And that would be made out of copper. And in a little bit, we'll take a, a break and we'll go see some of these stills. Because I think we probably have here at the museum uh, the largest collection of stills there are um, in the country. But anyway, this kind of shows you, it looks pretty rough there. Um, he's, you know, I think it's interesting, it's so interesting though that they took photographs of this and I'm so glad someone did because a lot of times you, it was such a rarity that anybody would have a camera and much less want to be documented doing something that was illegal. But fortunately, some of these have survived and people have um, donated these to us. Okay, on the next slide there. And here we have some women because women were a big part of actually um, producing the um, illegal whiskey. You know, they had to be involved in it. And that's something that we hope to explore in the future at the Blue Ridge Institute and Museum is kind of like the women's role in this because it's really, um, people really don't talk about it. And we hope that we can kind of focus on that in the future. And uh, we have some great oral histories from some local people and uh, we are hoping to get some more photographs to kind of talk about what they were doing. They were helping with the process, but they were also having to um, accept the fact that they were raising their children alone while um, their husbands were off uh, making this alcohol. And you'll see right there, that is a huge turnip still. It's kind of like that, um, and it's made out of copper. And you see the gentleman in the back there, but you know, they were very proud. They were like, hey, look at us. This is a huge operation and um, they wanted their photo made. All right, the next slide here. These right here, I thought that was interesting. Um, Earl Palmer was an Appalachian photographer who was very prolific. He made lots and lots of photos of Appalachia and he came through the area and he obviously was a quite a talker because he talked a lot of people into um, uh, taking him to their moonshine still sites, and uh, which was actually really good. And he made really, really wonderful photographs. And we actually have the largest collection of his negatives. Um, but right here, these are cans. These are five gallon cans and they're made out of metal and they're called jerry cans. And so they would have each held five gallons of alcohol. And so this was a very efficient way of um, you know, moving the, the alcohol to and from. Um, but by the World War II, these fell out of favor because um, metal was being recycled, people needed it. So they then switched to a lot of the glass jars. And um, later on, of course, we were using the um, gallon, plastic gallon jugs. But many people, I mean, I, I, I will still see these rusted out jerry cans if I go for a hike somewhere. It's, it's amazing, they're just kind of part of our landscape and they were in very much in use. All right, next. This gentleman is a very interesting character. His name was Lincoln Gussler and I don't know if you can tell, he is wearing a, a, a hat made out of copper. He was a coppersmith and he made a lot of the moonshine stills in the area. He was born in 1899. And he, that's all he did his whole life. And he made a very good living doing that, um, you know, smithing with all the copper. And people would actually go to his house and he would have like hidden in the walls, these fake walls, um, he would flip around and there was all the, you know, any kind of equipment you needed. You know, if you broke something, he had it already made for you. Um, and then he also made a lot of the large, um, stills that were in the area out of copper because um, the turnip style was made out of copper and, and kind of soldered together. Later on, it, it was just made out of metal. So copper was extremely valuable and you had to know what you were um, doing with it. And I, the next slide will show you, um, let's see, right there, that was part of our exhibit. We did an exhibit on moonshine and that was the most popular exhibit we have ever done at the museum. We've done over 25 exhibits, but that one had to stay for about two years and it actually traveled throughout Virginia to different museums because it, people wanted to see it. And this right here shows you Lincoln Gussler's um, little shop because when he passed away, he left everything to us. 
because he knew we appreciated his his handiwork, his craft, and it was a real craft. And it that right there shows you, I see his uh, copper hat hanging up there on the wall, but he even made copper shoes. He just loved copper and knew how to work with it. But he was a person, everyone, I mean, he was, he was just the resource for copper. And so everyone would go to him and get um, him, you know, to help them set up their steel or, you know, supply them with different equipment that um, they did need. All right, the next slide. Now this right here is a much more recent photo. And this is showing you how Franklin County went from the very small copper um, stills to these large ones. These are called submarine stills and they are not made out of copper. Uh, two sides of those are wooden. And these gentlemen are standing there because they are revenuers and they had discovered this huge site and then of course destroyed this illegal operation. But um, to give you some background, um, so much has been written about, you know, Franklin County and why is it so, you know, why did it flourish here? And it really, it's because we started very early with, you know, our ancestors making this and just taking a lot of pride in it. And it was really a, a matter of, uh, a system already in place that when prohibition came about, which was 1920 to 1933, I mean, that's when, you know, you can't make alcohol. Well, that just lighted a fire in Franklin County. And that is when it really flourished and became almost industrial scale. Because um, from in the 1930s, it has been documented and we, you know, by various people, but it was documented um, like the fair mercantile. They would bring in, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds of sugar, you know, to sell. They were supplying all these folks because in 1892, the train came through Ferrum, the Western part of the county. And so um, it is estimated that in the 1930s, that over 6 million gallons of liquor was made with these products. Um, and, in the 1930s, folks made um, $10 million. That was the 1930s in Fairham, Virginia, this area. And in today's money, you know, in current dollars, that would be 120 million that these, you know, very rural people made in the 1930s making, you know, illegal whiskey. So they were all about the quality and the quantity. So that's why Franklin County is known as the moonshine capital of the world. Um, you, it, it was really viewed as a business from a very, um, from the very beginning almost, just like, wow, I can make some money with this. And so um, it was something that many families did together or, you know, was hired out or whatever, but that's, um, you know, a huge part of our heritage in Franklin County is this um, illegal business because folks just knew what they were doing and a lot of this was passed down in families and even my family you know my grandfather was someone that would actually get a whole carload a train carload of sugar order just for himself and it would be delivered to Ferrum and at night he would go up there with his crew and unload it and then take off with it and it's just you know, I would think that probably 99 out of 100 people would say their family in some way or another was connected with making liquor because it's just part of, of really the culture of Franklin County. All right, the next photo. And there you have, this kind of shows you what a very simple turnip style still is. And this was done actually in the 19, well, actually this is about 1981. A really nice gentleman there who used to do it for a living and, um, we got permission to actually set something up over at the uh, farm museum. And we put right there, you can see the kind of the uh, mason jars right there. And we wanted to show people um, actually how this worked. And when, I don't know if you'll remember Charles Corralt, when he came through the area, he was you know, on the road again with Charles Corralt and that was CBS. He wanted to see how this was done. So we had to show him, um, I wasn't around at the time, but we wanted to um, show him exactly how it was still operated because he was, he and his viewers were very curious about that. And the next slide. 
And this is what we have over at the 1800s Farm Museum, because again, they would have had their own still for their own use, probably. And um, even though it was a German farmstead, they would have had this. And it's interesting, a lot of people back in the day, a long time ago, and they still do to a certain extent, they will um, have, say, a jar or jug of liquor on their table and will make like a coffee lace in the morning. You know, that, that will get your day started. Um, my great great grandfather, I have the jug that he used to have on his kitchen table. And every morning he would just take a swig of it and then just begin his day. So it's just, it's just embedded in the culture that just, you know, it's what you make. It's just a product, another product. And um, it's just, um, it's very synonymous with, with who we are. And let's go to the next slide. Ah, and this is, I think, a really pretty photo. These are the different varieties. And a lot of times, you know, the liquor would be clear, but also it's nice to add some fruit to it. And we have here, we have some strawberry right in the middle, and we have some peach, and we have, I think, some damson right there. And to the very right, that is more of the medicinal type because people still do this and you know it's a real big thing now for folks to talk about natural healing and all these natural remedies and people talk about tinctures and all this natural stuff well that's all it is this is kind of like a tincture because tinctures you'll you have to use um, alcohol a lot of people use vodka but you can use moonshine so on the right there you'll see that a lot of like bitters were added and different things um, for healing properties back in the day and at um at the museum we actually host it's called the blue ridge herb lore gathering we host that every june and we talk about um you know the old time ways of of taking care of yourself and part of this is just what that is right there using something that you can take that, and that you can make so that's what we have right there about the history of um, liquor and distilling in the Blue Ridge, especially Franklin County. And I think we'll move on now to another area so I can kind of show you some of our artifacts. Those are great, great pictures, absolutely. Let me just get out of the slideshow here. Um, one thing that I was thinking, I had no idea that this was going to be such a major part of the economy. I mean, those numbers you gave us were just amazing. Um, can you tell us a little more about the logistics? Because they were moving so much product back and forth to their stills. I mean, it's amazing that the law enforcement were not able to crack down on them on a major scale. So can you tell us a little about the logistics before we move to the different area, such as um, how did they get it carted all the way into the mountains and then back? And how were they distributing the liquor at the end? Well, that, I'm glad you asked that. That is a big part of it. And um, it was, you know, it's synonymous with, with what people um, did, but it was also not looked upon as um, anything shameful or anything like that. And a lot of people would go along with it. And even law enforcement would go along with it. There was the liquor conspiracy trial of 1935 in Franklin County, which was national. It was a federal conspiracy. And it was all based upon um, uh, the law enforcement getting paid off uh, by moonshiners to look the other way. And so um, this came about and, you know, nothing really happened, <laughs> you know, because it's, uh, they, no one was really punished very much for this because it was just typically a way of life. You know, it's just what people did to make a living. And a lot of people would say, well, it was, you know, our answer to welfare. This is how we supported our families and it was just accepted. And, um, you know, people don't make these large volumes of alcohol anymore that we know of, but people are still making this. And, um, you know, for their own private consumption and some, you know, because it's, it's great quality. They want to sell some of this, but you know, back in the day, say that you unloaded all this sugar off of, um, you know, one car load of sugar, that would have been taken, um, you know, you would have it set up, it was an industry, you would have had, you know, your, um, 
the men working for you, they would have had either their wagons and horses or, you know, if you had cars, lucky you. And so they would just have this network of how to get it to where they needed to get it. Um, it was interesting in 19, it was like 1935. And I'm just saying this because my, I know my own oral history, but my grandfather actually had um, used a bulldozer. He bought a bulldozer just to um, moonshine because he was very, very successful with it. It had been handed down to him by his older brother and that's how he learned. And in 1935, he built a um, two-story brick house. He bought a brand new Ford truck and he bought a bulldozer all with cash. And it was, you know, from making alcohol and the bulldozer he used just to make, um, you know, roads and paths through, you know, the rugged terrain, just so he could get, you know, his equipment, everything, you know, unloaded and set up. And he would talk about, you know, having done that and then being out in the woods, um, you know, for weeks and you would actually bring chickens, live chickens. I mean, there was no convenience store. You would bring live chickens with you, you know, in cages and you would cook them on the still because it was hot. And, um, you know, that's why, you know, we need to talk about the women because weeks at the time there the woman was raising, you know, how many of her children she had. Um, and it was, it was a very interesting life. And my grandfather always said he never wanted his kids to get into it because it was so, it, it was so rough and it was very hard. Um, and the interesting fact about him, he came from the Western part of Franklin County and he grew up literally without a mother and father. They both died when he was a child. And um, he was like kind of moved around from older brother's family to another. So, you know, hardly having any education, but he learned this trade from them. And then he became just really successful with it. I guess, you know, he had nothing to lose. You know, he was just not scared about what he was doing where other people talk about, oh my gosh, being out in the woods at night, I was, Every time, you know, I heard a twig or whatever, I would just panic. And, but my grandfather, Wilbur Worley, he actually um, just had incredible stories and like it was nothing. You know, he actually supplied um, Jerry Falwell Sr.'s father was, they called him a bootlegger. Well, he may have been a bootlegger, but he also had a very um, interesting bar in downtown Lynchburg. And my grandfather, Worley, would deliver him the Franklin County moonshine and he would take it upstairs in the bar and empty it off the, the jerry cans that I showed y'all and he would empty those into a bathtub upstairs go downstairs and turn a faucet and there you had it <laughs> so I mean the stories people have from not that long ago are just fascinating and you know this was told and I what you know are you kidding me I just thought it was just fabulous and just you know incredible and it was like oh it was nothing it was just well what you did but people yeah. were just making a living and then from that you know say you were caught okay because eventually you were probably going to get caught um you would go to um prison and you might stay for maybe two or three years it wasn't you know it was not hard times um and but while you were in prison you learned a trade like my grandfather learned how to run a sawmill so when he got out well he had you know set up a sawmill because he had all this money made from from moonshine and then he started um making certain products used for moonshine stills so it's just funny how it all just keeps going and goes back into you know what he had learned in the very beginning so people were very um, just proud of how you know people would view I guess and still do um, folks as hillbillies but boy and call me a hillbilly any day these people were very resourceful and very tough and they were very successful mm. yeah sounds like it great all right if you're ready we'll go to the next section okay okay so right here in the foyer of the museum, we have, I talked about Lincoln Gussler, who was this great coppersmith. And what, there's one of his little, just, just for, you know, just to be, make something cute, he wanted to make this little copper bucket. So he made that. And behind there is a book that we sell. It's called Making Liquor by Morris Stevenson, who was an, um, 
just a really great character himself and an author he wrote for the newspaper and he loved talking about moonshine and he collected great stories and then we walk around here and we have right here this is just a sweet little model of a uh, turnip style still and this was made by lincoln gussler and people do I, you know it's, it's kind of a fascinating thing to think about people love these little stills um and right here this book is really good this is called 100 proof by the amos law family they were uh, really well known for making alcohol and they actually have their own um, legal distillery now and they sell their products in the abc stores um, all across the state this right here this is really neat this um, jug is the tf bailey you can see that right there and to think that it survived but um, this was a distillery out of north carolina that actually came into Virginia when they outlawed whiskey making in North Carolina. They came up here in 1909 to Ferrum. And um, I guess because we had that, you know, the railroad, which was wonderful. And they stayed here for, I don't know, about 10 years until it became okay for them to, to go back to North Carolina and start making alcohol again. Of course, then until prohibition. And then over here, most people think, you know, oh my gosh, yes, you've got the mason jar right here, which people think is just goes right along with with moonshine and it really does but what's interesting about this one i don't know if you could tell i'm trying to see it's the number 13 right there on the bottom and that is seen um to be very unlucky because these moonshiners being scotch irish they were very superstitious and um they just thought well i am not gonna you know i am not gonna put my product in the number 13 that's gonna get me caught for sure so they would just smash those mason jars with had number 13 on the bottom so if you come across a number 13 on the mason jar, you've got something special. So now I'd like to take you into um, actually the back in the um, archive, and I'm going to show you a collection of moonshine stills that we have. So, so um, you all are getting a real sneak peek into the recesses of the archive here because we really don't let anybody back in here. Um, but we have assembled here just for y'all some of our um, our stills, and this is not all of them, by the way, but this is some. And so I'll show you this one right here is kind of funny. This one it actually belonged to my great uncle. I don't know how he came upon this one, but um, this one didn't produce very much at all. But it was kind of something cute, you know, you would have for your for your home use. And I talked about the submarine still. Now this would have been again though. This is a small one. This is a submarine still. And you can see that um, it's made out of, you know, the two sides are made out of wood right there. And so when you started really want to producing, you know, quantities, this is what people were using, but it, um, they were much larger than this. And we have larger ones in storage. And then we've got the beautiful kind of turnip style. And this one here, like this one right here, um, you can, I don't know if you can tell it's copper. And we don't want to clean it because we like how it looks, but that would be, you know, just a beautiful copper color. And you can see, you know, how it was made right there. Just the details amazing. And this is what's called right here, a copper worm that folks needed to make the alcohol. And then over here we have another example. And then right up here we have a cap. Right up here. And this is our workroom back here that part of the archive that we have. And then right here is another smaller example of a little steel top right there. So that's what we have here in the very back that we wanted to get together for y'all. And um, we have more. <laughs> I'm not gonna go to where that storage is located, but this gives you, I think. A great idea of um, how popular it was to have these items because uh, you know we were able to get these and you know when you were caught sadly all the stuff was cut up by federal agents known as revenues but these survived and we we're just thrilled you know when we ever someone says well hey I think I've got something that survived we we love to have it for the collection and a lot of what we have we will loan out to other museums throughout the country. Um, and so they can, you know, show people 
this little the little one right here that I said was my great uncle's, this actually was loaned to the Library of Virginia when they did something on prohibition, which was really neat. So we like to document what we have, but also share it so everyone can enjoy the heritage. That's great. What's the oldest bill that you have? Um, I would say the oldest one here is probably this one right here, the one above it to the right. Uh, those are the turnip style. And, you know, that's probably turn of the, probably around 1900. Mm -hmm. Those are. Yeah. And it's really neat to look, you know, it's craftsmanship. And um, that's how people viewed it. And a lot of people say when they made their own steels, that they'd like to somehow, even though you don't want to, of course, sign your name to it, because, you know, if you were you know, busted, you didn't want your name on it, but they would do, you know, certain little markings because they were proud of what they did and mm -hmm. wanted to put their own little twist on it. Thank you so much. That was really amazing. And thank you so much for the special behind the scenes were that we got that was uh, quite a treat um but yeah i mean that's really interesting and um especially here at the museum we focus on 18th century culture but when you look at um historical documentation you can see that many places even um, if you look at the shandoah valley mm -hmm. way up the road from where you are people in the 18th century they were um stilling they were creating distilled liquor and in fact, it was a cheaper product to export than having to export the fine, the, 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 the fruit or the grains or That's whatever right. they made the stills out. So it became an important source of their income as well. So, and it's really fascinating to see how that tradition continued from the early frontier time, which is that our museum is focusing on mm -hmm. until the early 20th century. And even now, I mean, it's wonderful right. that your museum is keeping that history and that culture alive by creating these amazing, especially wet events. So I'll definitely come to one of them. That's great. That's awesome. great. Yeah. So thank you again very much. Um, if any of our viewers have any additional questions for you, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Uh, they can just email me, my personal email. Perfect. And we'll make sure we include your email address and the comment section below. So. Okay. Thank you again. That was wonderful. And thank you everyone for watching another episode of our lecture series. And I hope to either see you in person here at the Frontier Culture Museum or at the next lecture series recording. So thank you so much. Take care everyone and stay safe.